Hello and welcome to Dateline London. Europe's refugee crisis leads to a temporary reversal of core European ideals about the free movement in the European Union. Is this much more than financial matters, the crisis which could drive the EU to breaking point? Plus, Jeremy Corbyn as Britain's Labour Party leader. My guests today are Annalisa Piras, who's an Italian writer, Abdul Bari Atwan, who's an Arab writer and broadcaster, Alex Dean of Conservative Home, and Agnes Poirier of Marianne. Well, one of the core values of the European Union has always been the free movement of people. In Britain and elsewhere, that has always had its critics since immigration from within the EU cannot easily be controlled. But now, the refugee and migrant crisis, which has hit Spain, Italy and Greece, has spread to Hungary, Croatia, Austria, Slovenia and even to Germany, which temporarily had to close down the pathway from Austria into Germany. Is this a test of the European Union more serious even than questions over Greece and the Euro? First of all, Italy. I mean, Italy's not the focus this week, but it has been for a very long time. I mean, what kind of strains and stresses is that causing within Italian society? Extraordinary strains. And uh, we tend to forget that Italy has been living something very similar to what we're seeing now for 15 years. And nobody really was paying any attention because it was deemed to be an Italian problem, especially from the north of Europe. But there was this kind of almost indifference because there was the Dublin rule that say that uh, refugees should be processed where they landed. So on Italy, it has had a very, very extraordinary strain, especially on the south and on the resources, which was why uh, Italians were somehow um, encouraged to let them go through, which caused other problems in the rest of Europe. So Italy has got a lot of uh, lessons uh, to, to share with the rest of Europe. But mainly what Italy has been saying very, very loud recently is that uh, Italy knows that this is not a problem that can be solved nationally. And uh, it has been proved over and over again. And instead, what we're seeing is that countries still think that they can go with a national interest, uh, narrow-minded solution, which is not going to solve the problem. So I think that uh, Italy, at this moment in time, is uh, able to play a very important role in trying to move on uh, in comparison with the kind of let's close the borders attitude because uh, Italy has tried to do that. It doesn't work unless we work all together. We're not going to sort this out. It's, a, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because this weekend we've had the Croatian prime ministers blaming Greece for letting them through. Uh, Greece is saying the EU's let us all down. Then there's Hungary, Croatia, Slovenia. Are all there's, there's a lot of finger pointing. There is no so far a European solution to this? No, but we've <coughs> gone, I mean, there's an evolution and a good one in the last, since June. You remember in June, there was this idea thrown at all the European leaders of quarters and they all, and Francois Hollande was the first one to say no. Thank you very much. Now, he said, well, actually, let's do manda mandatory uh, quotas. It was two days ago uh, with uh, Matteo Renzi, the Italian uh, prime minister, at Modan, where actually we've had problems not only in the last uh, you know, uh, summer, but actually for two years. Mm -hmm. And although the border there, the Franco-Italian uh, um, border is not closed, French police every day mm -hmm. is actually bringing back people to Italy, where they first uh, landed and registered. Um, and now it's very poignant to see the migrants and the refugees, because I think we should talk about the refugees, but also the economic migrants, go through the Balkans. Because those are countries that are still recovering from the war, the Yugoslavian war in the 1990s. They are themselves migrants, economic migrants. And they still, but also they've still had refugees. I mean, I talked to the Croatian ambassador yesterday who said, who reminded us all, there were a lot of Croatian refugees during that war, and Serbs and others. I mean, th they're still recovering from that. Yes, exactly. absolutely. And there's the ethnic, um, you know, volcano, because they, the, you know, the reconciliation between the different countries, Croatia and Slovenia and Kosovo and Montenegro and Serbia. Some of them belong to the EU, but not to the Schengen zone. Some of them belong to the EU and the Schengen zone, like and Slovenia, some yeah. of them don't belong to the EU. And that <clears> brings back to the enlargement, in my view, a terrible mistake, the enlargement of 10 new countries. Um, when was it, 10 or 14 years ago. Um, and, but we have to deal with it. You know, it's not good saying, oh, uh, it's Greece's fault. It's, um, you know, the Italians are not uh, dealing with it. Well, actually, the, the Italians have been dealing with it so well. Um, and we let them da down in many aspects. Now, it's, you know, we've been very busy with Greece and Brexit. We should have seen it coming. 
because the Syrian because war... Because, well, it's, it's been, been years, years in the making years. in Italy. Uh, and Libya, too, as exactly. Been... And, and Italy has been saying, look, we, we need help, and we just uh, didn't pay attention. So now is a time, perhaps, in all this um, tumultuous times to actually come with a common approach. But then... Well, but then, what is exactly, it? common approach. What sort of union do we want? Do we, do we want, want more? It's, and, it's, and it's, it's classic Euro navel gazing that says, in the face of this discussion, what kind of European Union should we be? <laughs> Let's examine our own structures and uh, institutions a bit more. Uh, and people around this table seem admirably unwilling to point fingers, so I will. I, I think it's Angela Merkel's fault as much as anything else. When you make an open statement <coughs> that basically says, come one, come all, are you surprised when they do? Uh, you opened this discussion by twice saying this was a temporary cessation of freedom mm -hmm. of movement. I don't actually know on what basis you can say that with any kind of <laughs> no. confidence. Well, it's been going for a, for, for, for a while and they, everybody the, says it's going to be temporary. Well, I mean, this I, may, may be wrong. New, this may, may be, be the new normal. Yeah. And you also made an interesting comparison with Greece and Grexit. Of course, the four great fundamental freedoms of the European project include not just services and goods, but people and capital. In Greece, we saw capital controls because finances were so mm. skewed by the membership of the European Union, they couldn't devalue and control their own currency. Well, now we're seeing uh, freedom of movement of individuals change. And in my view, rightly so, because there are many within this uh, new movement of individuals who are not in any under lawfully understood sense of the word refugees mm -hmm. and are not in any sense of, of the word, as we would understand it, asylum seekers. They're economic migrants and completely understandably, and we might all do the same, want a better life. But that doesn't mean you've got a legitimate claim to asylum or refugee status. And to process those properly, you do need borders. Do, do, you, see, do you see any way out of it? Because uh, when I talked to the Croatian ambassador yesterday, he was very interesting. He said, we have suffered it ourselves. We wanted yeah. to be generous. And then effectively, I'm summarising, reality kicked in and we suddenly realised there were 7,000 people in one day and we can't do it. And that's the Angela Merkel problem too. Yeah, first 4,000 people arrive in Germany, flags are waved, cheers are, are, sh are cheered, <laughs> gifts are given at the station. 18,000 at Munich later, people are saying we don't like it very much, and 100,000 later they close the borders. So I think we have the right policy in the UK, which is to say support people in the camps, support them where they are, especially around borders of genuine conflict zones like Syria. Sorry, just let me finish. Around uh, conflict zones like Syria, because there you can identify real need, rather than encouraging those who've got the get up and go to bribe or force their way across many peaceful countries mm -hmm. to get to Europe. Often in order using to crooked people things. to take yeah. them. Uh, Alex, when you send warplanes to bomb them them in the Middle East and say, no, please don't come to us. This is, this is absolutely wrong here. 20%, you know, they, are not, they, are not, they are not economic migrants. Those people are running for their lives they, because, oh, because their country is destroyed completely because of the Western policies on that part of the world. Your assertion is wholly no, untrue. Listen, listen, you're, listen, you're just well, let, let, let finish, Alex, and then we'll You are come talking about 10,000. You know, Lebanon, which is a very small country and very poor country and has a 50 billion debts, you know, accommodated more than a million and a half million Syrian. Jordan, which is a very poor country, has no water, has no minerals, has nothing at all, accommodated two million Syrian migrants. And you are saying that now oh. uh, we have to go, as, we did not help them. Turkey, Turkey, two millions. And what, what Europe, how many, how many, how many millions European absorb of, of okay. those refugees? I don't, know what, I, don't know Alex, happened, I don't know what's happened to get you so upset. Yeah. I was being very clear. I was talking about refugees and asylum seekers and migrants coming to Europe. Hmm. My point was help people in those environments where they have arrived there because of conflict zones. But Eurostat shows us that from uh, April hmm. to June, uh, April to July in Europe, only 20% of the people coming into Europe are from Syria. What, what, uh, Most the, of the rest are not. Barry, can I ask okay. you, you, you talked about this hmm. extraordinary work that is being done in Lebanon yeah. and, and Jordan, yeah. and yeah. nobody doubts that. Hmm. It's not being done in some other Arab countries, though, and is it? We're a lot, a lot richer, oh, yes, the Gulf definitely. states and, yeah. and, and Because there are, you know, uh, Gulf states, rich Gulf states like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, you know, the Arab Emirates, they are following the, the British and the American and the uh, Australian examples. They don't want it. Right. We are rich. We want to be rich. We are not going to pay any attention to those poor people who are That's running for their lives. This is the problem. But also, you know, there are other countries. Sudan, for example, is a very poor country. Mm. They are accommodating those, uh, taking those refugees. The same thing in, 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 uh, in, in Morocco, the same thing in other parts of the world. We must help those people. We they, must they, help more. We, we, we must, must help more. more. Help. But 98% yes. of Syrian refugees went into neighboring countries. So we are a that continent. Was my point. We are a continent of five. 
200 million people and we mm. cannot accommodate exactly. 160,000 people. Yeah. Come on. I mean, yeah. that's what uh, Europe is trying to do. It's trying to show a little bit of compassion yes, it's admirable that and a, li a little no. bit of <clears throat> generosity, which yeah. is also self-interest because all demographic expectations say that by 2020, Europe needs 40 million new people, not so 160,000. No, well, it's both. That argument has been made in Germany, both. hasn't it's it? It's about, I mean, about our, uh, our tradition, our values uh, as a continent that values human rights and human compassion, and it's also an economic issue. Okay. Yes. As, and as, it's as also a, a fairness issue, yeah. as, as uh, Barry was saying. I mean, the usual, countries down debate. there are doing so much, and we are doing so little. Well, they also do quite a lot of shouting, too. Uh, the rhetoric that you're delivering now is precisely what encourages people to bribe people smugglers and get on leaky boats with their children and leads to many deaths. It's also typical of the fact that you see this debate really as about your own virtue rather than about what happens to the individuals concerned. It's actually about you and demonstrating your own virtue rather than what's no. in the best but interest Alex, of the individuals aren't you, concerned. But you, Alex, you, you, you're focusing on values. what you it's see as pull factors. He's talking about push factors, and there are undoubtedly push factors, are there not? Sure. Across North Africa, mess that is Libya. Yes. Who, whoever is culpable, we can get to. But there is a mess in Libya, there's a mess in Syria, and these people are coming. And that's and why pushed. the British policy of helping people where they are, <clears throat> where their claims are far more likely to be valid and genuine, than those well, who've come across many peaceful countries but, to get here. But Alex, you, know, you say, don't come to us. But OK, why, do you, why are you coming to us? you know, freely, without visas, without Schengen, without anything, just sending your warplanes now. Your warplanes are bombing in the Middle East. So Syrian people waited five years for you to sort out their problems. You did not. Libyan waiting for five years for you to, you know, for plan, plan B of the NATO in order to fix the country which you broke. You, you did not. So the problem is, and now you say, no, please don't come to No, they must come and we must help them. You know, honestly, because it is okay. your mistake here. That, so we must, you, we, you, you broke you the area and you have to fix okay. it. That's 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 you love, love doing a lot of shouting, you guys, <laughs> but do you believe in actually having any tests at all in saying anyone come to another country? Or would you have no limits and allow everyone to come? Why not? You went to India, you went to, uh, you know, Egypt, you went to all over the world. And now you don't want us to come to okay. <laughs> well, uh, Can I come in Let's go to the here. other imperialist power so, here. So I don't think the... You know, the unhappiness of the world is due to British uh, imperialism, no. which, is, which is dead. Um, and not also what's, British, happening, you know, look, what's happening I'm in the Middle East is not completely, you know, it's not Western's fault. Uh, now, <laughs> um, yes, I mean, we must make a distinction, and Merkel did it actually, between refugees, um, political refugees, asylum seekers, and economic migrants. We can't take them all. We should take Syrian refugees. Yes. Um, and um, France said 24,000 in two years. It's not sure. much, but it's okay. Mm. Um, if we all pull together, I'm talking about Syrian refugees. Yes, that's now economic migrants. Um, that's another question, and we should take do you, do you, what we need. What we need. Do you, do you think? We, I mean, we've got well, on a dispassionate basis. basis. It's up to us. Yeah. But do, can you? Do you think the root cause of this is solvable? I mean, we, well, there we, are talks with Russia. We could talk about Russia because Russia we're talking Syria about one end of the problem. Yeah. What about, so the other end of the problem is actually in Syria. So now. Yeah. So we've got Russia and the US talk to each other yeah. and something might uh, change in 10 days time mm -hmm. and the UN uh, cancel. We've got Putin who's going to make a speech for the first time in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so I want to know what yeah. Barry... So thinks do I actually. And actually. John Kerry is in yes. has been in London. He's talking yeah. to yes. uh, the Foreign happening. Secretary. You know, the problem is, you know, uh, European and American from the day one they understood the Middle East very wrongly. You know what I mean by that? The Russian were saying, look, you know, the problem is ISIS. It is not the Assad regime. Let us give priority to ISIS because it is really <coughs> causing a lot of problems. The American listening to the Saudi and other rich Arab states said, no, we have to topple Assad first. So Assad haven't been toppled. You know, it is five years now and the country completely dismantled and uh, Islamic State is expanding. So now for the first time the American said yes you are right let us actually uh, you know create some sort of alliance together with the, because you know the only the only subject the only issue the whole Middle East and the world is agreeing upon is the Islamic State as the main danger so now the Russian and the American are going to cooperate for the first time since you know the second are you, world are you war, sure of that are you sure, I'm of, sure that? of that because you know what 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 Kerry said 
He said, you know, okay, we accept Assad to, to stay as a president, you know, or stay in power for a short time, not, but not for a long time. But are we speaking but, about troops? Yeah, and he said, you know, okay. R Russian, Russian, troops. Russian, Russian troops. Russian troops, yes. Russian and troops. He, he said, we will meet next week with the Russian on the military <laughs> basis and to talk about the Syrian crisis. What they indicated, the Russian wouldn't send troops to Syria without American and Western approval. They are sending tanks, they are sending uh, um, uh, military experts, fighter soldiers, jets. fighter jets, everything, because they realize that if the regime in Syria collapsed now, I mean the whole, the whole establishment collapsed, we will have another Libya we, we, and we'll have the Islamic State. That's why I, I think this is a turning point here. We haven't agreed much around the table. But I mean, that <laughs> might be a breakthrough, might it? And it would be an, an acceptance that perhaps the United States and Britain has not read the politics of Iraq, Syria very well over the past. Oh, a collection of mistakes, and, and there is at least partial truth in the point that we broke things and then didn't fix them. I mean, we should have been far more involved in Iraq in the post-war environment. And some of the uh, asylum seekers and refugees coming with genuine claims are still coming from Iraq and Afghanistan, so uh, there is that. But in Syria, of course, our parliament voted against military action. Mm. Um, of course, we then needed to decide whether we were for or against Assad, as well as being certainly against uh, IS. And have we decided this? I mean, no. it's, uh, it seems baffling, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so it's I, a four-way civil war. You we, could will, say. we will presumably have to go back to Parliament for uh, having set this precedent that Parliament must vote in order to uh, commit ourselves to military action. Um, Parliament will have to vote again, and I simply don't know which way the par our Parliament would come down on that question. Well, again. because uh, part of it is uh, real suspicion across Britain and the United States about these quote foreign adventures that they just go wrong and we're not getting it right. That's part of it, isn't it? Of course, the Iraq lesson has been uh, learned quite hardly by a lot of politicians, so everybody is very reluctant to put a boot on the ground. But uh, at the same time, it seems that in the years since Obama said that uh, we were going to destroy and annihilate ISIS, one year has gone by and very, very little progress has been done. According to some reports, only 25% of its <coughs> capabilities have been uh, touched. So this is a very, very big issue. But there is no alternative from a military intervention. I mean, all the experts say that, you know, you are not going to make progress unless you really go for it. Because they have land and while they have land and freedom to operate. Let's, let's move.